الحمد للہ رب العالمین والصلاۃ والسلام علی سید المسلین اما آباد فاعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم پھر الصلاۃ والسلام علیک یا رسول اللہ وعلى آلك وصحابك يا حبيب الله الصلاة والسلام عليك يا نبي الله وعلى آلك وصحابك يا نور الله Please also repeat after me نويت سنة الأيتكاف The Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم They used to sit so close to each other That if a sheet was placed above them, you would not see the dips in the sheet. They used to sit that close together. So this is a sunnah of the companions of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to sit close together. And it brings the muhabbat amongst us as well. My dear Islamic brothers, whenever you are blessed with an opportunity of entering the house of Allah azza wa jal, ay, the masjid, first and foremost you must realize that you are very, very lucky. Allah azza wa jal has blessed you that you're able to come to this house today. You're able to come to the house of Allah azza wa jal. So you are amongst the fortunate ones because we all know that there are many Muslims outside that are not here today. But when coming to the house of Allah Azza wa Jal, try and always come according to the sunnah of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. My dear Islamic brothers, by making this intention for the duration that you're in the masjid, whatever you're doing, waiting for someone, looking for something, or leaning against a radiator to keep it warm, whatever you are doing, you actually get the blessings of being in itikaf. May I remind you, it is forbidden in Sharia to eat, to sleep, and to drink in the masjid. But if you make this intention, you can make it in your heart, you can make it in any language, you can make it in English. Make this intention, then for duration that you're in the masjid, you get the blessings of being in the masjid. So a small amount of effort, but a huge amount of reward. There are also many blessings of reciting through the park upon the Prophet of Allah, sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa Sayyidina Imam Sahavi, rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi, narrates that the Prophet of Allah, sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa has stated, that the one who sends through the park upon me once, Allah Azza wa Jal shows ten blessings upon him. And the one who sends through the park upon me ten times, Allah Azza wa Jal shows a hundred blessings upon him. Allah. Allahu Akbar. And the one who sends through the park upon me a hundred times, Allah. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that the one who sends through the park upon me a hundred times, Allah Azza wa Jal inscribes between both of his eyes that this person, he is exempt from hypocrisy and the fires of hell. And on the day of judgment, he will place him with the martyrs. Sallu ala al-Habib. My dear Islamic brothers, how easy it is to get so much reward. Reciting 100 through the park in a day is not a big wazifa. 100 through the park is something very small. You read our namaz five times a day. So if when we're going to the masjid, we recite it ten. When we're coming from the masjid, we recite it ten. At each namaz, if we recite this, then easily 100 through the park is done. And the reward is so great. Subhanallah. My dear Islamic brothers, many of us here, all have participated in watching films, Many of us will have participated in watching sports, be it football or cricket. Now whatever thing you have watched, be it football, be it cricket, be it a film, then for duration, that duration that you're watching that program, you're watching that film, your emotions are going high and low. If you're watching, for example, cricket, you get excited when your team, you know, hits some runs. You get sad when your best player is bowled out. And so your emotions are up and down all the way through the game and you're watching the game and you're really into the game and you're really intensely into the game. And your emotions are everywhere because you want your team to win. So you're happy, you're sad, you're angry if your bowler doesn't do properly, you're angry if your batsman doesn't play properly and all these emotions are going. And then what happens at the end? At the end when the game is over, when the final run is made or the final wicket is bowled, then you take a deep breath and then you go back to your normal life. But for that period of time that you've been watching that film or you've been watching that game, your emotions have been up and down, you've been happy, you've been sad. But then you realize that this is not the true world. I'm back to my normality now. I go back to work now. I go back to my normal things now. And you realize that that is just one 
small part. Allah Azza wa Jal tells us in the Quran that this dunya is like a game. Allah Azza wa Jal tells you, and I give you the translation from Kanzul Iman, that the life of this world it is but a game, it is but a pastime. The home of the hereafter, that is the life if only they knew. So when that final whistle is blown at the end of a football match and you realize that it's just a game, eventually that time will come where our eyes will close for that final time and when they open again we'll realize that this dunya is just a game. It's just a small twinkle of an eye. The hereafter, the akhirat, that is our destination. And for that, my dear brothers, we need to prepare ourselves. You know, that person that spends all his life building everything here in England, he builds a massive house here, but then when he retires, he goes and lives abroad. Then you say to him, so what have you built everything here for? That is your hereafter. That is where you're going to go and settle down. That's where you're going to have, you know, you're going to get married and you're going to have kids and you're going to stay over there. But you built everything over here. It doesn't make sense. So the hereafter is what we need to prepare ourselves for. But unfortunately in this dunya, shaitan puts many traps for us. Because so the aim of shaitan is to stop us from getting to paradise. And he will put all sorts of traps in front of us. He will do everything he can to stop us attaining our final goal. And then inshallah in today I'm going to just mention some of the traps that shaitan puts in front of us. And that we need to look at ourselves, look at ourselves and say to ourselves, am I falling at any of these traps? Are any of these traps affecting me? Am I coming into the, any of the traps of shaitan that's stopping me from attaining paradise? Number one, lusting after wealth, greedy for money. Allah, unfortunately, every one of us, our whole mind revolves around the pound note sign. We're after money all day long. We'll plan. Every day we'll plan that tomorrow I'll get up in the morning, I'll do this many hours, tomorrow I'll do this, tomorrow I'll make this much money, tomorrow I'll achieve this, I'll get this money, then I'll do this with it. How many of us have sat down at night and said to ourselves, okay, tomorrow is a bank holiday. Tomorrow is a holiday, I have an opportunity. Yeah, to get so much nikiyah with me. I've got an opportunity to do so much ibadat. What am I going to do today? What am I going to do tomorrow? Do we make these plans? Unfortunately, our mind revolves around the pound note sign. Just to give you a few examples. Shabbat Berat, inshallah, that blessed night will be upon us soon. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that on that night, more people are forgiven than the hair of the tribe of the sheep of the tribe of Bani Kalb. And at that time, the tribe of Bani Kalb, they had more sheep than anybody else. And so the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that this is a night in which you have your opportunity to get all of your sins forgiven. And more people will be forgiven on this night than the, the hair on all of them sheep. Now how many of us, when that night comes, will come and spend all night in the masjid? How many of us will come and stay here in the house of Allah Azza wa Jal and do sincere tawbah for all the sins that we have committed? Unfortunately, very few. Lakin, if I made an announcement today, if I made an announcement today that whoever comes to the masjid on that night, all of the debts will be written off. I'll write you a check for all your debts. You come to the masjid, whatever your debt is. If you got a hundred thousand pound debt, I'll write you a check. If you got a hundred ten thousand pound debt, I'll write you a check. If you got a hundred pound debt, I'll write you a check. Those that have got a five pound debt, they will come to the masjid as well. Because they want to get rid of the debts. They've got this financial gain that they've got. But when it comes to akhirat, no time, no time. To get rid of our debts, we'll come to the masjid, we'll stay here all night. What do you want us to do? We'll be here. But when it comes to getting the akhirat, to getting the pleasure of Allah Azza wa Jal, to get our sins forgiven, we haven't got time. Another example, inshallah Azza wa Jal, the month of Ramadan is not far away. The blessed month in which we are told that our ibadat, Whatever we do, the reward is 70 times greater. In that month, there is one night in which Allah Azza wa Jalla has told us that that night is better than 1,000 months. Laylatul Qadr. Now Allah Azza wa Jalla said it's better than 1,000 months. He doesn't say it is as good as 1,000. The mercy of Allah Azza wa Jalla is great. 
but it's better than 1,000 months as a minimum. How many of us will search for that night? We'll stay up every night and look for Laylatul Qadr in the hope and pray that, Ya Allah, I pray that tonight is Laylatul Qadr, tonight I will do Ibadat. But if I was to offer you a job, and I was to say to you that, look, I'm going to give you a job for one month. I'm going to pay you £10 an hour. Not a bad wage. But this job is only for one month. And ah, in that one month, there is one night. There is one night that I'm not going to pay you £10 an hour. I'm not going to pay you £100 an hour. I'm not going to pay you £1,000 an hour. I'm going to pay you £100,000 per hour. But I'm not going to tell you which night it is. I'm not going to tell you which night it is. Now, how many of us would take a holiday? How many of us would take a night off? How many of us would take that risk of missing that one night which I can make £100,000 an hour? I'm not going to take the risk. I'm not going to miss that night. I'm a fool if I miss that night. And if, if you did take some days off, and at the end of the month when your wage slip comes, and you realize that you missed that night, how much pain will you have in your heart? How upset will you be? You know, that night, oh, oh that night I went to cinema. That night I was playing football. That night I was with my mates. That night I was on PlayStation. That night I, I just slept. Oh no, I've missed that night. Kitra dukhoga. Lekin Lalutul Qadr jane se koi dukh nahi hai. This is our mind. That we run after money. We run after money. We run after money. But we don't think about the akhirat as well. The akhirat is the. There's so As Muslims, we have great opportunities. We have great, great opportunities to get so much reward. But we don't think of it. Come and read your namaz with Jamaat. 27 times more reward than reading it at home. Now if I was to say to you again, think money. If I think money, you understand. If you think blessings, you don't understand. If I say to you, look, work from home, I'll give you a tenner an hour. Work in, work in my place, I'll give you 270 pound an hour. How many of you say, no, no, it's okay, I'll, I'll work from home, no problem. I'll stay at home, I'm okay, I'm sweet, no problem. No, you'll all come to the workplace. You'll all come for that 270 pound an hour. But when it comes to your nikiyam, when it comes to your reward, where you can read your namaz at home, and you come to the masjid, you'll get 27 times more sawad. Oh, it's okay. No problem. Why? Why do we not think like that? We need to change how we think. We need to realize that our true goal is getting the akhirat. That's just one trap that shaitan has put in front of us. Money. Lusting after wealth. Number two, love of this world and its pleasures and no preparation for the hereafter. You know, we put everything in this dunya. We're only here for a short period of time. We don't realize. We build houses here. We get big cars here. We get businesses here. I'm not saying it's haram. Yes, no problem. Get your nice houses. Get your big houses. Get your big cars. Get all of these things. No problem. But also prepare for the hereafter as well. You know, in this country, there's a lot of people that come to this country. Some of them come on student visas. Some of them come on work permits. Some of them come to visit people on visas. And what happens is a lot of them, well not a lot of them, some of them, when the visa expires, they don't go back. They don't go back home. And this country classifies them as illegal immigrants. The illegal immigrant is not. The illegal immigrant, what is it with him is, He's scared. He's scared that I might get caught. He's scared that when he gets caught, he's going to get taken straight to the airport or he's going to get put in a prison cell. And once his, once his case is done, he's going to get put in the airport and he's going to be sent back home. So what does he do? He tries to make as much money as he can. As quick as he can. He'll work day, he'll work night, he'll do overtime, he'll do everything. Right? But what will he do with that money? He won't buy a house here. He won't buy a car here. He sends it all back home. He'll send all that money back to his family. All of it will go there. He'll earn the money, send it back home. Earn the money, send it back home. Day, night, everything. Earn the money and send it back home. Because he's scared that he's going to get caught. He's scared that when he gets caught, he won't be able to grab all of that money and send it back home. He'll lose that money. But what about being caught by the angel of death? Aren't we going to get caught by the angel of death? We are going to get caught by the angel of death. Now, I'm not asking you today, what have you sent back home? 
But I'm asking you today, what have you sent forward? Because when the angel of death comes, you're not going to have time to read one, two nafal, you will not have time. You will not have time to read your kalma. Those lucky people are those that get to read the kalma when the angel of death comes to them. You will not have time to give anything in sadqa. You will not get time to go on hajj. You will not get time to do any miroza. You will not get time to do anything. What you have got that you've sent forward, that'll be it. And everything's gone. So we as Muslims, we need to be like that illegal immigrant in a certain extent. We need to realize that any time now the angel could come and he could take us away. There is no guarantee. Just think for yourself for a moment. So we need to again change how we think and realize that look, the angel of death is going to come to us sooner or later. What have we done for that? Again, this is another one of the traps of shaitan. The third unfortunate habit that Muslims do, which is again another one of the traps of shaitan, is that we talk degradingly, we backbite and we swear. The youngsters today, they feel that unless they can include a swear word in the sentence, they've not got a complete sentence. They have to include something in that sentence. They have to include a swear word, otherwise the sentence isn't complete. It's almost compulsory. It's part of the English language to swear, but it's not. And backbiting, how many of us perform this sin of backbiting? Allah Azawajal says to us that backbiting is like eating the flesh of your brother. But how many of us do it? We do it without even thinking. To talk about a Muslim behind his back, to talk about a Muslim in such a way that if he was to hear them words, it would hurt him, is backbiting. To criticize, Imam Ghazali says that if you criticize someone's transport, for example, or you've seen his car, it's a bit of a dodgy car, that should be in the scrapyard, that car, I would never drive that car. That's backbiting. To criticize someone's clothes, have you seen his clothes, them clothes? 70s fashion them, you'd never see me in them. That's backbiting. To criticize food, if you get food from a takeaway, for example, if you get food from a restaurant and you come home and you're eating the food or you're with your friends and you're eating the food and you say, have you said, this is really dodgy stuff, this is, this is horrible, this is. This food, you know, what has he put in this food? That's backbiting. You are actually backbiting. A Muslim, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, that a Muslim is like a mirror to another Muslim. A mirror? When you go home, look in your mirror. The mirror will tell you whether your beard is straight or not. The mirror will tell you whether you've got any marks on your face. The mirror will tell you if your glasses are straight or cockeyed. They'll tell you all these things. The mirror will never jump off the wall, run down the street and say to him, Hey, that, you know that guy up there? His beard is all over here the place. It will never do that. The mirror tells you. And as Muslims, that's how we should be. If I have a fault inside me, as a Muslim brother, you should come and tell me, brother, you know, try and stay away from this. Don't do this. Tell me, don't, you should not be going telling other people my faults. You should come and tell me my faults. Do my Islam, rectify myself. Because otherwise, if you go and tell everybody else, you're gossiping, you're backbiting, and you're earning the fire of hell for yourselves. Swearing. A Bazur Khanadin, he said once, that the person who swears, it is better for him to eat excrement, to eat that stuff that you get, that you put in the toilet. It is better to eat that than it is for you to swear. Because the effect that swearing has on you, you do not realize. The excrement that you eat, that dirt that you eat, you can clean yourself. But to clean yourself from swearing, takes a lot longer. But unfortunately today, we feel that we have to do this. Hi. Number four. Lazy in our salah. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was reported to have said that on the day of judgment, the first question that will be asked to man out of all of his deeds will be, be about his salah. If his salah is correct, he will succeed. But if his salah is incomplete, he will be disgraced and he will suffer loss. But I've just heard in the media that they're thinking about putting microchips, barcodes in people's necks. You know these people that leave jail, instead of putting them on the, on the straps that they put on the ankles, they're going to put a barcode on their neck. So they can keep an eye on them where they are and they know where them people are going. Now if I was to put a strap on you, on your ankle, or if I was to put a barcode on your neck, yeah, and every time you miss Salah, a 10 pound fine comes to your house. 
how many of us would miss our salah? We'd be afraid that we're going to get a £10 fine, so we won't miss our salah. We have to change how we think. We have to listen to what the Prophet of Allah has told us. And if I put a financial penalty on it, we understand it. But when I give you an akhirat penalty, when I tell you what is going to happen to you in your grave, when I tell you what's going to happen to you in the fires of hell, dikhi jai. Allah Akbar. The fifth trap that shaitan tries to put in our way is bad company, our friends. The effects that our friends can have on us are astronomical. They can really affect us. And you need to, and you, everybody needs to examine who their friends are. If you close your eyes and you think about your friends, and when you think about them, you think of big cars, you think of money, you think of parties, you think of successful businesses. They're not your friends. But if when you close your eyes and you think about your friends and you think about that person that keeps on giving me Nikki Gidawat, he invites me to the masjid, he tries and gets me to come on the Madhbi Kafla. He picks me up at home and takes me to the masjid. He gives me risala. He, he does all these things for me. That is your true friend. That is your true friend. He is your friend. Them other people, they are acquaintances for you. Them people are not going to help you. On the day of judgment, the, whatever they have given you, the money that they have given you, the drugs that they have given you, the alcohol that they have given you, the parties that are given you, they are not going to be of any help. But that's, that namaz that that person has made you perform, that helped you perform, that kafla that he's helped you to go on, that will help you on the day of judgment. And just to give you an example of what the effect that your friends can have on you. If again, I give you the example of a football game or a, or a cricket game. If you play football, if you play football and all of your friends, if you read your namaz five times a day and your friends don't, then when the time for namaz comes and you say to your friends, look, it's the time for namaz now. I want to go and read my namaz. Your friends are going to say, come on, man, you know, you're messing the game up here. Let's just finish the game. Let's finish the game. If, if you go, we're going, to have to, you know, we're going to have to finish the game now. Because of you, we can't finish this game. Just, just miss, you know, read it a bit later. What, what difference does it make if you miss one namaz? Only one namaz. And you miss one namaz. Then you miss two namazes. Then you miss three namazes. And then what happens is, you become like your friends. But if... Let's say, for example, you don't read your namaz. But all of the players in the football team, they all read namaz. The time for namaz comes. The brothers say, okay, we're going to stop the game, now we're going to go to the masjid and read our namaz, and we'll carry on the game afterwards. Are you coming with us? No, nah, my clothes are not clean. You, know, you make these excuses. You know, they'll make all sorts of excuses that I can't read my namaz, my clothes, you know, you know I can't, I'm sorry. Yeah? Okay, no problem. First time, second time, third time, you start to think to yourself, look, the brothers are inside the masjid, I'm stood outside in the rain, I might as well go in and read it. And what happens is, because of your friends, you will start reading your namaz. This is just one example of the effect that can have on your friends. I know of one person that he didn't take drugs. He was married. He had three kids. But we saw, some of the brothers saw that he was associating with those people who did take drugs. So they went and did infradi koshish on him and said, look, they're your friends. You're not denying that you're friends, but don't stay with them. They will affect you, you know. I don't want you to start taking drugs. If you keep on hanging out with them people, you'll start taking drugs. And he said, no, look, I'm, I'm, I'm not a kid. Who are you talking to? You know, I'm married, I've got three kids, I'm not stupid. You know, I know what I'm doing. Don't worry about it. So, okay, tiger. But what happens one day, he has a bad day at work. He comes home, he has a bit of an argument with his wife. He goes and sees his friends, they offer him a spliff, and there you've had it. He becomes addicted to heroin. Why? Because of the people that he hung out with, the friends that he had. You need to ask yourself, who are my friends? Who do I associate with them? What effect are they having on me? Number six, the unfortunate actions of the Muslim is our character. You know, if you want anything dodgy, people know where to go to. If you want to buy drugs, people know who to come to. If you want anything stolen, they know who to come to. And unfortunately, they're coming to Muslims. In this country, do you know that we represent 3% of the total population? 3% out of every 100 people, 3 people are Muslim. But unfortunately, when you go into the jails, 
And alhamdulillah, Dawah Islami goes into the jails. We go into the jails in this country as well. We go and give Nikki ki Dawah in jails. We go and do halke in jails. We have classes in jails as well. We do all of these things. But unfortunately, 25% of the people in the whole of the UK in jails are Muslims. How bad is that? That 21 in every four, one in every four inside a jail today is a Muslim. And you can go to some jails where the percentages are a lot higher. But overall, nationally, 25% of the people that are in jail today, they are Muslims. Because of our character, because of what we've done and what, we'll think, what people think of us. There's a story not very far from here in Manchester city centre. A taxi driver. I've mentioned this story to the brothers before. A taxi driver, he picked up four passengers in a black cab. Two men, two women. And he started, he reset the meter, as they do. He reset the meter and started the taxi. He drove a few miles and two of the passengers said, can you stop, we want to get out here. So when they got out, they came to the front of the black cab, they asked the driver, how much? He looked at the meter, he said, six pound. The meter said six pound, they paid six pound. Now there's two people still in the black cab. Now what the taxi driver didn't do, he didn't reset the meter. He said, he didn't have to, he didn't reset the meter. And they carried on traveling. And when they got to the destination, they got out of the black cab, they came to the driver, and they said to him, how much? Now he looked at the meter, and it said 12 pound. So he says to the passengers, your friends have paid six pound, you pay six pound. Here you go, no? You all understand? You know what they said to him? They looked at him and they said, you're not a Muslim, are you? Now, if somebody says to you, you're not a Muslim, you get a little bit. Yeah. And he says, yes, I'm a Muslim. And they said, no, no, you're not a Muslim, are you? Now he had a small beard, he had a topi, he had a tasbih around the mirror. You're not a Muslim, are you? And he said, he started getting angry. He said, I am a Muslim. Why, why are you saying I'm not a Muslim? I am a Muslim. Why are you saying this? He said, if you were a Muslim, you would charge us 12 pound. Think about it. Is that what people think of Muslims? That we fiddle people? Is that what people think? That this is how low we have become? That this is the character of Muslims? That when people look at a Muslim, they want to run away from them because they're afraid that they're going to get done over? Is this the mentality that we have given, the image that we have given to the people here? We are told that the Muslims, they are the best of humankind. They're the best ummah. They are the favored ummah. They're the ummah of the final prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But we have lowered ourselves so much that this is what people think about the ummah of the prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Islam is haq. There is no doubt in Islam. The problem is us. If you look at the time of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi you look at the companions, you look at how deen spread at that time. It didn't spread because people read the Quran and compared it with other books. It spread because of the kirdar, the character of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the character of the Sahaba, the character of the Buzurkan al-Deen. The kirdar is what spread the deen of Islam. I say to you today that if all of the people of just this town, this town that we are in today, if all of the people of this town followed Islam properly, acted according to the sunnah of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and had that beautiful character as their example, didn't lie, didn't cheat, didn't swear, then I say to you within a very short space of time, the whole of the city will read the kalma la ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi that is what we have, that is our failing. That we are not following the kirdar of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. People look at us and don't want to speak to us. They don't want to come near to us. They're afraid that this guy is going to do something to me. This guy is going to cheat me. You want credit card fraud? Come to one of us. You want insurance fraud? Come to one of us. You want drugs? Come to one of us. Whatever you want, we'll get it for you. Yeah, Mario Katarayaji. Allahu Akbar. So our character is very, very important. 
the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he saw a janazah going and he said, people were speaking ill of the person, that this person, he was a bad person, he wasn't a very good person. And the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said that when a person passes away, if people speak, speak ill about that person, then hell is wajib for that person. I ask you, my dear Islamic brothers, what do people think about you? What do your neighbors think about you? What do your friends think about you? What do your colleagues think about you? Do they think that you are a good person, that you are a nice person? Because if they think you are bad, if they dislike you, if they're afraid of you, then the Prophet of Allah said, when people pass away and people think of you in that way, then hell is wajib for you. There was a similar janazah that was going past and people were speaking good about them. That this person, he was very good, mashallah. He was good in the community, he helped people, he was kind, he was gentle. And the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said that when a person passes away, if people speak good about that person, then heaven is wajib for that person. Think to yourself, what do people think about me? The seventh trap that unfortunately the Muslims fall into is having excessive pride. We have a lot of pride. We think that just because we've been on Hajj, then, you know, is guaranteed for us. Jannah is guaranteed for us. We think that because you know I fast during the month of Ramadan, then Jannah is guaranteed for us. We think that because I did all the Travi prayers, then Jannah is guaranteed for us. And we start to have pride inside ourselves. Not just pride in the sense that we think we've got paradise made, but we also have pride inside ourselves in other ways as well. We start to think that we are better than other people because I've got education. We think that we are better than other people because I've got money. We think we are better than other people because I've been successful in my life. This pride, this takabbar, again, opens the gates of hell for you. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said that if a person has a mustard seed of pride inside him, then he will not enter paradise. And we've all heard that how shaitan, how shaitan fell because he thought himself better than man. Because he said, I'm better. I'm created in fire. This person is created in clay, in mud. I'm better than him. Why should I worship him? And because of that one act, that one act of thinking that you are better than someone, Lord him. How many times do we think we are better than people? You know, just a few things that if you have inside you, if you have a few things inside you, then this pride can come to you. If you have a lot of knowledge, then you start getting pride inside you. You know, I, I know something. I know what I'm talking about. Come and ask me. And that pride is not good for you. If you have money, if you have wealth, then all of you think you think you're better than other people. Because I have money. I have all this money. I can do what I want. I'm better than these people. They don't tell me what to do. If you have family status. You know, if you have connections. I've got connections. You know my family? You know, I can get away with anything, me. I've got these connections, this pride inside you. If you've been successful in this world, then you start getting this pride inside you. Those brothers that have a lot of strength, yeah, wow, well, I'm these guys are weaklings, I can lift it up, I'll show you how to do it. Yeah, I can do this, I can do that. This strength inside you that Allah has given, remember this, Allah has given you that strength. That strength starts to bring pride. These sort of things are symptoms. I'm telling you, these sort of things are things that if you have inside you, then these things you have to keep control of. Because these things can cause you to have pride. If you're, you know, just get on those people that, have, that are handsome, that are beautiful, then because they think, you know, I'm beautiful, or I'm handsome, or this, and then people again, they start to have this pride inside them, that I'm better than other people. So these things can bring the sin of the kabr inside you. So you have to be very, very careful about all of these things in your life. Number eight, stopping people's profit, not wanting other people to succeed. Unfortunately, nowadays we see the Muslims that we are not happy if our fellow Muslim brother is successful. We should be happy. If my Muslim brother has opened up a business and he's earned it in a halal way, and he's got himself a land cruiser, and he's done good for himself, mashallah. You know, may Allah give him more, because he's worked hard for it. But unfortunately, what happens? We have this jealousy inside us. 
why has he got it? And he's not worked that hard, you know. Maybe he's doing something dodgy, yeah. And nowadays, this this sin of badgumani, you know, that when you see somebody driving a nice car, if you see somebody driving a nice car, even he's in his twenties, automatically you think drugs. It might not be drugs. He might have worked hard. He might have got that as an inheritance. But why are you why are you committing this sin? Of having these negative thoughts about a person. What is the point? What have you achieved? And then if a brother is successful, yeah, we don't we're not happy. But then when his business starts going down, we start becoming happy. We start thinking to ourselves, okay, you know that shop that he's got? He doesn't know how to run it properly. Yeah. When it goes bust, I'll open that shop. I'll open that takeaway. I'll open that cloth shop. I'll open that taxi base and I'll show him how it's run properly. And I will make that business successful. What should a Muslim do? If you think you have good advice, go to the brother. Look, brother, I've heard your business isn't doing well. I think you should do this. I think you should do that. This is my advice. You know, I think, inshallah, if you do this, it will be better. Why are you holding that good advice to yourself? Why? Because you don't want your Muslim to succeed. You want him to fail so that when he fails, you succeed. That's not what we should be like. You know, there's a famous story that in the streets of Madinah, there was a person, he went into a shop. He went into the shop and he wanted to buy some material. He said, look, I want to buy this much material. I want this quality of material. And I don't want to pay more than this. So the shopkeeper said, look, I have that material. I have that quantity of material. I can give you that quality of material. I can give you the price that you ask as well. But, my dear brother, there is a shopper opposite me. He also sells material. I've noticed all day nobody has gone in his shop. Go and buy the material from him. Allahu Akbar. How many of us will do that? Someone comes into our shop and says, can I have a look at this? And okay, I'll, I'll just go, I'll, I'll just go to that shop and have a look. No, no, don't go there. <sighs> Dodgy stuff there. He'll rip you off. Yeah. Second, yeah. Well, everything will make all the excuses. You're lying. You're backbiting. You're slandering. You're gossiping. You're committing all of them sins for a few pennies. Isn't that sad? That we don't want our fellow Muslim brothers to succeed. Get that source keep out there. Number nine. No mercy for the believers. He's, why should I forgive him? He does not know who I am. He should come to me and ask for forgiveness. It's not my fault. He should come and ask for forgiveness. I'm not going to him. Who does he think he is? Does he not know who I am? We want, we don't want to forgive anybody. We don't want to forgive everybody. But we want Allah Azawajal to forgive all the sins that we have committed. We want Allah Azawajal to forgive everything. Ya Allah, humare tamam ko naon ko maaf kar dein. Lekin mein haapko nahi maaf karunga. Mein haapko nahi maaf karunga. Lekin Allah, mere saare ko naam maaf kar dein. How? Silly as that. We should forgive each other. What is wrong? You know they have a, a saying in Urdu, nak kat jati hai. You know? If I go to somebody, agar main uske paas jaun, meri nak kat jayegi. Yaar, wo banda dakha, yaar, jiski nak kati hai, bhi dekhna chahta hai. I haven't seen it happen. If you go to somebody that is younger than you, if you go to somebody that maybe the status is lower than you, or whatever, and you go and ask your business, if you go, go and ask for forgiveness from that person, you're not lowered. Aapki izzat bar jati hai. Your status is high because you have humbled yourself. And as a Muslim, we should humble ourselves. Aapne kabhi dekha phal ka drakht? A tree that has apples on it, it doesn't put its apples up in the air like that. Lows itself. Fear. There's the fruit. Take the fruit. And as Muslims, we have shawmas to give. We should humble ourselves. We should be humble inside. And if we are humble, inshallah, and we ask for forgiveness, kya jata hai, yaar? Ek dujhe ko maaf kar de. What, what difference does it make? Marna hai sabne. We're all going to die and yet you've not forgiven each other? Allahu Akbar. Number 10. The unfortunate act of the Muslim is that he's stingy. Allah Azza wa Jal ne aapko maal diya. In this country, Allah Azza wa Jal has blessed us. We came to this country. Why did we come to this country to earn a living? Our parents, our elders, they came here for a better life. Now Allah Azza wa Jal has blessed you. We come here with the intention to change ourselves. Amin bi jahil nabi al-amin.